Fitzroy. So, so I'd like to also introduce our guest speaker today, and that's uh, Tony, Tony Farkery. He is a leading health and self-empowerment expert, and he's an author of three books. He always brings quality information, um, and tonight is no exception. He is a coach, um, a wellness coach, and a corporate speaker. So I just um, I really welcome uh, Tony, and you're going to get some really good inf nuggets tonight. So listen carefully, take notes, and hopefully you get some information and you take it away and you, and you uh, use that um, productively. So I just ask you to just mute, uh, put yourselves on mute, and then I'll hand you over to hand you over to Tony. Terrific, thank you, Simon. Um, so welcome everyone to tonight's presentation. So just uh, reiterating, if we could all have our mic on um, mute, please, that would be wonderful. Um, you may have noticed that my image is coming across a little bit distorted and I sense there may be a bit of a technical issue with streaming. So uh, apologies uh, for the distortion. Um, so just a little bit about me, uh, Tony Fackery. I've been involved in the industry now for approximately 15 years working as a, uh, I call myself a self-empowerment um, author, speaker and coach and also uh, a speaker. So prior to uh, COVID, I was running corporate seminars um, at a corporate level, of course, um, going around Australia delivering health and wellbeing seminars, working with a number of executive teams, uh, CEOs, and it was an incredibly fulfilling story and uh, a wonderful passion. And so regrettably, a lot of that work is now turned online. So I'm still working with those organizations, but at an online capacity. So I guess I've had the experience in those last 15 years of working with corporate individuals who I've seen uh, facilitate stress in, in various ways. So hopefully I'll bring a lot of insights tonight into this presentation on how to manage uh, stress in our lives. And given the situation that we're in with this pandemic, it's ever more uh, pre uh, prevalent and relevant that we talk about how to manage our stress levels and particularly for those participants who are coming to us from Australia or Victoria, New South Wales, wherever you may be, uh, this is an incredibly difficult time for us all. So a lot of the information that I'll present today is probably information that you know on some level. Um, and this is guidance. So it's a guidance in terms of incorporating this information into your life because we've found that working with highly stressed people, whether they be corporate individuals, stay-at-home mums or, or anyone, uh, we found that these types of recommendations really help to manage our stress levels. Okay, so just a brief outline of what we're going to cover. So we'll just start with understanding the causes of stress, how to manage stress through better lifestyle choices. Then we get on to how sleep is important. And this is one of the areas that are, are fundamental to help us manage our stress levels. And so it's important that we not undermine how much sleep that we're getting and also the quality of our sleep. And then we'll look at the role of nutrition, exercise, lifestyle in order to manage stress. And then I'll give you a really good practical example for um, honing the nervous system or managing the nervous system in order to reduce our stress. And then a summary at the end before we hand over to Simon. And then I believe we'll leave approximately 15 minutes at the end for question and answers. Okay. So if we imagine a fictional area where we have this, this line here, uh, zero representing the lowest order and 100 representing death. Now, again, this is only a fictional case here. So we're not sort of depicting reality. Imagine a case where you've had a really stressful day. 
and suddenly you walk into the kitchen and you drop a plate. And what you might notice is that your reaction tends to be quite exaggerated. So it tends to be in this realm of this higher end. Now, in truth, what tends to happen is that we have to learn to keep things in perspective, and that is maintain a sense of self-control. So ultimately, in reality, a plate breaking in, in comparison to being diagnosed with an illness or hearing of a loved one um, involved in a motor vehicle accident are totally different things. And the reason that we tend to over-exaggerate things is because of the brain's negativity bias. So evolutionary psychologists uh, believe that our biology is still wired according to uh, our ancestry or you know, primeval times. And that is when man was roaming the savanna and we had to look out for uh, wild prey, that biology still remains intact and unchanged. And so what tends to happen is that when we're faced with a stressor, we tend to over-exaggerate the situation. Now, that's not to say that what we're experiencing isn't a stress, uh, because how we internalize that stress is quite um, individual to each person. And so your response to stress is going to differ to, say, your, your loved one or your child or your grandparent. And we talk about this sense of developing resiliency and in fact, we develop resiliency by being exposed to stress a little bit at a time. Um, and therefore, we overcome those stress barriers. So when we talk about the typical warning signs of stress, and I really want you to give this some thought as we're running through this tonight, and that is they fall into four different areas, and that is spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional. So as we're talking through this, think about when you're stressed, what of these areas, of these four areas, do you identify with? For example, on a personal level, when I feel stress, I notice that I'm more prone to being anxious. I notice that I get a, a, an upset stomach. Um, I tend to become quite forgetful. So um, I experience a lot of these uh, mental type situations and also emotional. If I can relate an example uh, of a client that I was working with uh, for some time who was a senior economist with the federal government, whenever he was traveling into state, um, and I've worked with him for probably about eight years, he would always uh, forget his mobile phone or his iPad in an Uber or a taxi. Um, and it was a really a recurring theme. So he would lose devices. He would lose things. He would forget things in cabs. And that was his warning sign that he was stressed. So in that case, he was making mistakes and forgetting things. So when we're aware, when we're mindful of our reaction to stress, it allows us then to... Um, screen for stress. So these are the warning signs and it says, right, okay, this is interesting. I'm experiencing these mental um, episodes which are causing this sense of mistakes. I'm experiencing emotional reactions or it might be um, I'm developing more colds, uh, maybe flu-like symptoms or I'm eating more or eating less. So it's really a call to be mindful of how our body is reacting to stress. So in this slide here, whilst it may look a little bit confusing, effectively what we're talking about is in order to let go of stress, and this is something that fundamentally we can work on and not only an organizational level, but on a personal level as well. And that is, you can see there in the blue, representing the old thinking. And what we need to do is create a new paradigm. And you've probably heard the word paradigm being used. And it really means uh, a new way of thinking, a new way of understanding or a new consciousness in order to perceive our problems in a different light. So 
where I've got here, letting go, I'm talking about letting go of processes, letting go of the way that we've done things in the past in order to create this new sense of thinking, because effectively what got us to this point in time may not be what will get us to the next point in time. And sometimes if we carry the same um, level of thinking towards every problem that we face, then we're not approaching our problems with an open mindset. So it really means um, evaluating the way that we think and allowing ourselves to be open-minded in order to think differently about our problems. And you can see there on the left-hand side, I've made a little note that said, what has made us successful to date may not be what makes us successful in the future. So it's really about looking at how we're doing things, what processes that we're doing. In a corporate sense, what I've seen over the 15 years of working with uh, different levels is that um, within the organization is that people often say, well, this is the way we've always done things. And that is incredibly um, frightening and limiting because uh, technology, society, the world has changed to such a degree that um, that's almost saying, well, we have a 1972 mindset and that mindset has worked for us. So why are we going to change that? Um, and you can see at the bottom here, I've got a quote by Albert Einstein who said, you can't solve a problem with the same level of thinking that created it in the first instance. And what he's referring to is the sense that we've got to create a new mindset, um, a new way, a new approach in which we perceive our problems. Um, so our problems don't catch up with us. So our thoughts create stress because neuroscientists believe that we think approximately 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day, which is incredible. And they found this out through what they call fMRI, so functional magnetic resonance imaging. And so the idea is that if we're thinking this many thoughts a day, why would we associate with all these thoughts? So thoughts are running through the mind and then we cling or we attach ourselves to thoughts. In uh, Buddhism, there's this sense of uh, what they call non-attachment. And the sense of non-attachment is that um, we are not our thoughts, but the perceiver of the thoughts. Um, and the way that I relate this within a corporate sense to individuals and when I'm coaching and speaking is I often say to people, if you think of yourself as a radio um, and thoughts are signals, they're either an FM or an AM frequency, you are receiving a thought in either an AM or an FM modulation, but you are not the thought itself because if I change the frequency, then I'm changing what I'm listening to. And so we have the capacity to change our thoughts by directing our attention to something else or being mindful of what we give our attention to. Hence the word mindfulness, which has uh, probably exploded in the last uh, decade and a half. So it's this sense of um, point number four there of not clinging or ruminating on our thoughts, but noticing that we are perceiving our thoughts. Um, and there's a wonderful psychologist in the US called Dr. Daniel Siegel, who talks about the sense of naming and taming our thoughts and emotions. And what he means by that is when we are experiencing anger, we don't say, or we avoid saying, I am angry, rather, um, I am aware of anger. And what we're really doing in that context is creating a space between ourselves and the anger. We're distancing ourselves from the anger because we could be experiencing anger in this moment, but in the next instance, we may receive a phone call um, saying that we've won $50,000, in which case we will experience joy and elation. So we are not really our anger because anger is a fleeting emotion, much like uh, tuning a radio to an AM or FM frequency, we can change the frequency of what we're listening to. And a thought 
is um, aligned to that same um, example is that we can change what we're listening to, hence our thoughts. So if we look at what causes stress, I mean, in a really simple way, it's the situation and pressures uh, that are either external or internal. And you can see there on point number two is that it may be real or imagined. And just think about this in the context of your own life. And I know um, many of you and myself included, uh, when the coronavirus pandemic first started, a lot of us were imagining worst case scenarios. Uh, what does the future hold for me? Will I lose my job? How will I be able to pay the mortgage? And all these scenarios began to uh, run through our mind. And so they were an imagined state, a perceived threat. Yet the mind, the subconscious mind, didn't perceive it as an uh, imagined state. It thought it was real. And so it created this stress response in our body. Uh, and so point number three really evaluates that um, idea that the impact of the stressor will fluctuate between different individuals. So your grandparents uh, will experience stress on a different level to uh, young children uh, at the moment who are homeschooling and experiencing stress on a different level, being distanced from their friends and, and you know, hearing of this uncertain future. So it's how we internalize stress which um, shapes the way that we respond to stress. So just showing you some examples of stresses which are pretty obvious. Um, so external stresses, you know, the what's happening to us at the moment in terms of the pandemic, uh, the internal stresses, the stresses uh, that may come from illness or uh, mental health issues, the occupational stresses, you may be in a situation where working from home has probably given you um, added stress of having to manage your job in a different environment. It may be that you have a, a difficult employer or a difficult boss to report to. Um, in terms of the developmental stresses, we see that with uh, young children and, and teenagers who go through this period of uncertainty uh, as they develop and, and grow and mature. And then, of course, we have situational stresses, which could be more acute. And the situational stresses may be something that may be passing or an interim type stressor, uh, which causes uh, aggravation and disruption to one's life. So again, it's how we internalize the stress, what we say to ourselves during those stressful periods uh, and the thoughts and emotions that uh, eventuate from those episodes. So if we look at the four different phases of stress there, we see that we've got the alarm phase and that's the phase that, okay, hang on, something's going on here. I don't feel quite right. Um, I feel anxious. And remember those four points that we spoke of earlier where I um, outlined uh, the spiritual sense, the mental, the emotional, um, and the physical. And so when we get into the alarm phase, it's saying, okay, which of those four areas um, is my mind and body um, adapting to? What is it um, allowing me um, to create in this moment? And so after the alarm phase comes the resistance phase. And this is the phase where we say, no, this shouldn't be happening. And so of course we push through this phase because we don't want the stressor. We've got um, workloads, we've got um, you know, mouths to feed, a family, we've got a mortgage to pay. And so of course we tend to push on through this resistance phase and then regrettably we hit the exhaustion phase and that's where everything comes crashing down and we hit that burnout. In my work over the years, I've seen a lot of people suffer from adrenal fatigue and we've seen that um, emerge as the new illness of the 21st century because people are not heeding the warning signs um, at this stage here of the resistance phase. And you can see on your right hand side where I've got a picture of uh, the brainstem uh, and the nervous system 
and when you've got the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. And effectively, what that really means is that we've got this branch here of the parasympathetic system, which is otherwise known as the rest or digest system. And you can see what the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for. It slows our heart down. It constricts the bronchi. Uh, it stimulates peristalsis within the colon, uh, the release of bile within the liver. And if we look to the opposite side, this is the sympathetic nervous system, um, which is the opposite, what they call the fight or flight response. And you can see the different functions it does there. So it accelerates the heartbeat. It dilates the bronchi. And it's the sense that, again, to, get, to use a metaphor, an analogy, think of one being the accelerator on your car and the other being the brake. So the sympathetic, is, the sympathetic nervous system is the accelerator and the parasympathetic is the brake. Now, unless you're a Formula One driver, you can't basically have your foot on both pedals. So either the car's moving or it's stopping. So when the parasympathetic branch is activated, meaning when we're in this sort of rest or digest phase throughout the day, then we cannot activate the sympathetic system unless, of course, um, you're sitting at home, you're relaxed in the evening, you're having a, a cup of tea or a hot chocolate, um, and then the, the neighbor's property is burning, in which case you run out the door uh, and you call the ambulance, you call the fire brigade and you try and resolve the issue. So, but you can't be doing both at the same time. So again, if we think about it as the accelerator and the brake, our body has both these mechanisms and it's either doing one or the other. Okay. So one of the things that we've noticed in working with people who are highly stressed is this sense of where we fit in this continuum. So if we look at this sort of uh, large version of what I call Ayers Rock, ultimately where we want to be is in this white zone here of optimal stress. If we're in a, a job or a lifestyle where we are feeling this sense of rusting out, that we're bored. Uh, we may be experiencing low stress. So I've worked with a number of individuals over the years who um, had no purpose or clear vision in their job. And that then related or flowed on into their personal life. And so there was this sense of boredom. And so they found that they um, were underloaded, which caused the sense of rusting out. And when we talk about mischief, we're talking about this sense of when we're lacking a clear purpose and vision and direction for our life, um, then we tend to procrastinate. We're not making um, inspired choices. Then conversely, on the other side, when we're overworked, um, overloaded, not only in our work life, but in our professional, uh, sorry, in our personal lives as well then we experience um, burnout. Now, what this is really showing in the purple is depending on whether you consider yourself a low stressed person, a moderately stressed person, or a highly stressed person, the types of exercises that we do um, are going to either add or subtract to our stressor. So one of the mechanisms that's become quite popular in recent times has been this sense of chronic cardio. And chronic cardio is where people overdo cardiovascular exercises. So people are running on treadmills in gyms or they're running um, you know, 10, 15 kilometers every day or uh, doing spin classes. And, and whilst cardiovascular um, exercises are great, if you're a highly stressed person, person doing more cardio is going to cause the body an added stress because remember earlier we spoke about the accelerator and the brake so the body perceives the running action on a continual basis if you are stressed so again let me preempt this by saying if you are stressed so if you are a stressed individual and you are doing 
chronic cardio on a recurring basis, then the mind and body perceives that as a stressor and will create a uh, environment uh, that is catabolic. And what that really means is breaking down muscle tissue, uh, breaking down the nervous system as well. So it down regulates our nervous system instead of up regulate our nervous system. So the advice in this um, slide is quite simple. If you consider yourself moderately stressed, the types of exercises that we would recommend, and again, these are uh, suggestions and recommendations, is avoiding chronic cardio and gravitating towards relaxation exercises. Perhaps you'll engage in mild resistance training, uh, depending on your age too, whether uh, you're under 50 or over 50, um, bone density is, is an issue in both men and women. And so participating in a um, resistance program is going to strengthen those, um, the mineralization of the bone. And then incorporating fun activities as well. If we look at the other side of this, if you're a highly stressed person, then we recommend gravitating towards what we call working in. And it's this sort of um, holistic or integrated model of health and well-being that suggests rather than working out, working out seeing um, as being depicted, uh, you know, running and, and, and cycling, doing activities to move the body, that we're stimulating the body from inside out. So you can see there, uh, we've suggested yoga, meditation, mindfulness, Tai Chi, uh, another form called Qigong, uh, walking, swimming. So these are, remember the example earlier about the parasympathetic. These um, actually work the parasympathetic uh, nervous system instead of the dominant sympathetic nervous system. And then if we go to the other side, if you're a low stress person, then you can add in some resistance exercise. You can do some mild sprinting. Maybe you want to do some um, HIIT type movements, uh, high intensity interval training. Uh, and then of course, incorporating some of those um, fun activities uh, into your lifestyle as well. So one of the other areas that we've seen with people over the years to help them manage their stress levels. And it's quite a recurring theme is that many of these corporate individuals that I've worked with over the years have poor sleeping habits. And it might be because they're on call or they choose to be on call. And when I say on call, it's not that they're working shift hours, but um, when they're in a CEO position or in a senior position or part of a uh, executive team, um, it's, seen that they uh, need to have their mobile device on or their iPad on at night to be taking calls. Um, or it might be that they need to receive emails from their head office um, overseas. So their sleep patterns are disrupted. Um, and so the points that I've put up there on this slide are quite obvious in the sense that we know why we need sleep. Um, interestingly enough, our ability you can see in point number two here, is that we need sleep to actually help us deal with stress. Um, again, neuroscientists now believe that whenever we have nightmares um, or we uh, yell in our dreams, for example, and we're dreaming and having quite um, episodic dreams, that that's the brain's natural mechanism of actually releasing stress. So sleep is quite an integral component in helping us um, downregulate our stress and actually manage our stress better. So we can see it improves our short-term and long-term memory and reduces inflammation. And you'll see that in the upcoming slides where I talk about um, creating a, uh, a sleep ritual or a sleep pattern for our body. And so in this example here, in order to improve our sleep, now again, a lot of this is quite common sense and quite obvious advice, but the most important and the theme behind this that I really want to impart 
is about creating a ritual and not only a ritual, but a habit. So you can see here in the graph, um, for those of you listening uh, this evening, if you've got young children, you probably remember, they may be even adult children at this stage, but do you remember that when they were young, there was a ritual and that ritual was biathing. Uh, you'd give them a bottle, there'd be some gentle play, some story, cuddles, music, and then they were out like a light. And what we're suggesting here is to create some um, adult equivalent of that as well. So what we see is getting to bed um, at 10.30. So, <coughs> pardon me. This is just a guideline and we don't suggest that you get to bed exactly at 10.30, but follow an approximation. So it might be within that hour um, and waking up at approximately 6.30. So what we're doing is following our circadian rhythm, the circadian rhythm of our body, or depending on your uh, geographic location, um, the sun may rise earlier or the sunset may you know, go down later. So it really depends upon your geographic location. Now, of course, no caffeine after 2 p.m. is the idea that caffeine tends to excite the nervous system, but also excites the hormones such as cortisol. So it raises our cortisol level, which has a stress response built into that. And it's really about being mindful that we're avoiding caffeine. So we can certainly have caffeine up until that point, but also be mindful of how often we need caffeine. Um, and it might be um, a call for another um, issue or to work with a, a health professional, a dietitian, a nutritionist to really help us in that context. I've found over the years working with clients that those who are experiencing stress gravitate towards refined sugar because of the fix, the instant fix and the hit that it gives us. Um, many people uh, gravitate towards dark chocolates and whilst that's rich in antioxidants, uh, many people are also gravitating towards uh, dairy milk chocolate. So it's again, looking at why we need those in our lives. And we're not certainly saying um, to completely avoid um, sugar altogether, but we're looking at the idea of why am I needing this now? Is it because I have added stress in my life or is it um, a, um, a nutritional requirement? Am I feeling, um, as Sharon just said, 100% <laughs> guilty for the sugar fix? And yeah, exactly. We're all, we're all uh, guilty of that pleasure. And uh, you know, there's that sense that um, what is my body calling me um, to know about this situation? Is it a nutritional um, drop? Am I, am I needing more B vitamins? Am I needing more um, nutrients uh, and minerals in my body? Or is it that I'm stressed? And so again, uh, point number six is avoiding bright lights in the evening. So um, putting aside your um, smartphone, uh, your iPad, um, even turning down the lights um, in the evening, you know, after eight o'clock, dimming the lights. Um, if you can, um, turn off the TV where you can. I, I realize, given that we're all working from home at the moment, this is pretty difficult. And especially if you have a young family, it's ever more difficult uh, because everyone's coming together around the TV to so socialize and be together. Um, and then having a, a dark room, there's um, evidence to show that even a, a, sh a small light, the size of your thumbnail shined on the back of your knee is enough to actually um, cause a person to awake from dream. And they've done these in sleep lab studies. And then of course, um, using a, uh, a sleep routine. So if we look at the three ways to manage stress, so we've gone into the sleep component. We've looked at sleep. Sleep is a really good precursor to help us manage our stress. But there are other um, interventions. And one of those interventions is nutrition, um, exercise and movement, which we touched on earlier. And then, of course, our uh, lifestyle choices. 
So again, these are recommendations and, and I would certainly encourage you to work with a health professional, a dietitian or nutrition um, because there are recommendations. You may have specific dietary requirements. For example, you might be a vegan or a vegetarian or you know, have different dietary requirements based on your needs or your um, health needs. But generally speaking, as a population, um, what we recommend is avoiding the four white evils. And um, we call those uh, sugar, salt, flour, and milk only because they're probably the most processed products um, on the market. And all four of them um, are known to create inflammation in the body. And of course, when the body is inflamed, and when we're talking about inflammation, we're talking about organ inflammation. So if you've ever had a really bad meal and you've had digestive disturbance, you'll know how bad you felt mentally and emotionally. Um, so avoiding these as much as possible. And again, the recommendation is I realize that this isn't possible all the time, but it's limiting how much we eat of these foods or maybe gravitating towards other things. So for example, in the milk context, there are a lot of plant-based milks on the market these days, you know, the oat milk, um, almond milk, um, the different types of dairy, the, you know, what they're calling the plant-based milks, um, flour. Uh, again, these days, there are so many different types of flours. There are chickpea flour, there's um, amaranth, quinoa flour, buckwheat flours. Um, so there's wonderful places that we can shop for that. Um, salt. We can now buy salt um, such as Himalayan salt, um, sea salt, Celtic sea salt to add in our foods as well. Um, sugar, we can replace sugar with stevia. Um, and while stevia is still processed, we can actually take it a step further and buy green leaf stevia. So again, you can buy that from a health food store if you're asked for green leaf stevia. And you can use green leaf stevia, which comes directly from the plant and is unprocessed. Um, you can use that in cooking when baking, for example. So adding in um, antioxidant rich foods, all the vegetables, just think colors um, in this um, picture here. Again, if you're a, a meat eater, depending on your uh, meat requirements or dairy requirements, sorry, um, dietary requirements rather, what types of uh, meats, uh, you know, grass-fed, um, obviously, um, organic where you can, as much as you can. So gravitate towards meat because of its B vitamins and um, meat also um, stimulates a butyrate in the colon, which is really important for the lining um, of the colon and it creates a, a food source um, for the um, epithelial cells within the colon. Uh, again, depending on your dietary requirements, um, gravitating towards um, whole grains as opposed to refined grains. Um, fruits and vegetables, fish oils, um, but also fish itself. So uh, including fish on a regular basis, fish uh, oil or fish itself um, has wonderful properties in terms of its DEA and DHEA and EPA. So it actually creates these beautiful, um, rich environment within our brain for the neurons within the brain. So it actually has calming properties and antioxidant properties and anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, and so do the healthy fats such as coconut oil and avocado uh, and nuts. So it's really about balance. Uh, if there's one thing that I'd like you to take away from this is, is that it's this sense of balance and really creating a balanced diet as opposed to leaning towards one form of diet such as a, um, um, you know, a paleo diet by itself or a uh, a, um, a ketogenic diet or what's really become famous these days is this um, carnivore diet, only eating meat all the time. Um, uh, and again, it's just finding your needs uh, because what we eat really has a, an effect on our moods and the way that we uh, relate to stress as well. 
So just in terms of exercise, we generally recommend 30 minutes to an hour per day per exercise or for exercise rather. Uh, that is going to depend upon um, your schedule, of course. Um, you may be a busy parent. Um, you may have um, uh, a huge workload at the moment, um, given that you're working from home. So it really depends. But generally as a minimum, 30 minutes up to an hour. And then what types of exercise? Well, it's the sense of moving frequently. Um, I work with a, um, an osteo friend who does a lot of work with the corporate area and he's doing a lot of ergonomic assessments at home at the moment and setting up people's ergonomic um, workstations. And so we're seeing, or he's telling me that he's seeing a lot of um, chronic injuries um, have come up in the last 18 months because people are using ironing boards as desks. Um, because of course, we were thrust into this situation of having to work from home. And, and many people um, didn't have offices at home or workstations. And, and those that did, they may not be conducive. So, I mean, how many people have um, sit stand um, stations? So we're having to, um, you know, create these um, interim environments. So uh, moving frequently is incredibly important. Um, some form of strength training, even if you're doing strength training from home. And strength training from home can incorporate body weight exercises. So you might get up in the morning and do um, 30, 40 squats and then 10, 20 uh, push ups, um, burpees, for example, um, and do that in a um, hit manner. So that interval training. And of course, avoiding the chronic cardio. So if you're a person that gets high on running your 10 kilometers per day, is just be mindful of how you feel an hour after exercise, because that's often a really good indicator as to whether you're over-exercising or um, creating a pattern of um, chronic cardio. And then of course, incorporating some form of parasympathetic exercises. Uh, barefoot walking on the grass. If you live close to the beach, get out there and walk barefoot on the, on the sand. Um, some form of meditation or diaphragmatic breathing is really important. Um, and just in terms of lifestyle, uh, again, a lot of these will be um, pretty obvious to you. So just uh, you know, reiterating these points, and that is unhooking daily. So if you're working um, uh, you know, a 10 hour day, an eight hour day is creating patterns either throughout the day to get up and move regularly um, or to um, unhook from technology and, and distance yourself where you can. Now, again, I realize that this is incredibly difficult given our commitments and, you know, the family are at home now, uh, the children, we, we're having to homeschool as well. Um, monitoring your thoughts. Uh, if you can use a journal, it can even be an electronic journal by way of using your smartphone and dictating into that how you feel at the end of the day. That's a really important thing because um, we're becoming um, almost our own therapist. And by that, I don't mean we're diagnosing our mental um, uh, health uh, problems, but we're monitoring, we're observing um, how we're thinking and seeing the patterns in our thoughts so that if our thoughts do change and that we do become more stressed, then at least we know through journaling that we are stressed as opposed to um, calm and relaxed. Uh, creating a to-do list and, and really prioritizing um, your tasks for the day. And if you don't um, check off that list, then of course, moving it into the next day as well. Point number four, um, managing your time, learning to say no where you can and prioritizing your time. These days, I spend a lot of time on Zoom coaching individuals, mainly from overseas, the US. And in the other time, I'm doing a lot of writing as well. 
So I've learned to say no to at least nine out of 10 requests of my time. People want to do interviews. Um, uh, people want to have me on podcasts and, and so forth. So it's really learning to say, right, I really need to prioritize my time um, for writing and working with individuals. And when I'm not doing that, you know, tending to my own mental, emotional and physical health as well. Um, so not beating ourselves up around negative emotions. And that is, um, I've heard a lot of people talk about feeling guilty at the moment that um, they're not able to do everything. Um, you know, mothers talking about having to work at the same time as their young kids are having to be homeschooled and feeling guilty that they're not there for them. Um, and you know, we've been thrust into this situation that is not of our choosing and we're learning how to rewrite the rules. And so self-compassion is the key here. And it's shown that self-compassion and kindness is the doorway towards um, freedom um, and inner freedom. So when we can be more mindful of how we're reacting and notice our reaction, then we can change that guilt and become less reactive. And so, of course, getting more sunlight where we can, um, given that we're um, coming out of winter here in uh, Victoria or in the um, Southern Hemisphere, um, gravitating towards vitamin D supplements where you can, um, of course, getting adequate sleep. And I realize socializing is difficult because um, of social distancing and also because of isolation for many of us, but reaching out to people. Um, I've been doing this thing that just came naturally is whenever I get a coffee, I just ask the person that's making my coffee, how are you doing? Um, and it's really interesting to hear a lot of the conversations, even if I go down to the local shop or, or Coles or Woolworths, wherever it may be, and the person's um, bagging my groceries. And I just ask them, hey, how are you going? How are you coping through this? And it's, it's interesting to have those conversations. And it's really helped me have those conversations with people um, just to know how different people in our community are handling what we're going through. And of course, um, focusing on gratitude and cultivating that sense of gratitude um, in our life is really important. So I just want to introduce a, um, a quick exercise that we can use. And maybe we'll just do one sequence because I realize that we're just on um, 45 minutes at the moment. So I want to leave some time for question and answers at the end. So really what this is, is a way to what we call decouple or um, distance ourselves when we're feeling stressed. And it's a diaphragmatic breathing technique. So Recall earlier, I spoke about the accelerator and the brake. So if we're feeling that we have our foot on the accelerator and we're, we're, we're stressed um, throughout the day, in order to take our foot off that accelerator and put it on the brake and, and um, lean towards um, that sense of relaxation and calmness, we can use this um, breathing technique um, I believe it was first developed by or used, maybe not developed, but used by the Navy SEALs. And they have this axiom that says calm is contagious because they work in units of five or six. Um, if one person is stressed within that unit, then it tends to rub off on the other um, uh, individuals as well. So what this really calls for is uh, breathing in for four seconds then we hold it for four seconds. Then we breathe out for a period of four seconds. And then we wait four seconds before we retake that next breath. So let's just give that a, a quick go before we move on to the next slide. So if I can ask you to just sit upright and just get into a nice relaxed state and I'll guide you through it. And if we can all close our eyes for a moment, so what I'm going to ask you to do in a moment is to take a deep breath in through your nose while you have your mouth closed. And as you take that breath in through your nose, you will do it for a count of four seconds. Then you will hold it for a count of four. Then you will exhale from your mouth for a count of four. 
and then wait four seconds before we retake the next breath. So it's probably uh, relevant that we do two breaths so we can experience that pause. Okay, so let's get into it. All right, so on the count of three, two, one, breathing in through our nose for one, two, three, four, holding the breath, one, two, three, four, and then breathing out, one, two, three, four, and then waiting, one, two, three, four. Good. Now let's go into the second one. So breathing in through our nose again for one, two, three, four, holding one, two, three, four, exhaling one, two, three, four, and then waiting one, two, three, four. So if you find yourself feeling a little bit stressed, if you're feeling overwhelmed throughout the working day or at any time of the day, you can do this lying down. So you see the person there lying on their stomach, uh, lying on their back rather, and they have their hands over their stomach. So what we're doing is trying to elicit the response from the diaphragm and just create that sense of calmness throughout the body. So the four seconds is enough to actually change the physiology within our body from a stress state to a calm and relaxed state. Okay, so just as a summary before I hand uh, back to Simon at the end. So it's about being mindful of our stress and those warning signs before we get to burnout, which appear through your body. And sometimes stress, or in most instances, stress will manifest itself as a physical sign. So a tight chest, a tight neck, uh, short, short, uh, shortness of breath, for example, a headache. Second point, use diaphragmatic breathing and mindfulness to decouple yourself from stress. So to distance yourself from the stress. The third point is get adequate sleep. Make sure you're getting enough sleep for you. So it might be eight hours for you. It might be six hours for your partner, your, your loved one, for example. Follow a balanced nutritional diet at all times and not when you're stressed. And this is a really important point I found over the years working with corporate individuals is that as soon as they're um, diagnosed as being stressed, then they begin to follow a balanced diet. And by that time, it's a little too late. So it's really about um, intercepting it well before we are feeling stressed. And then, of course, incorporating daily exercise into your life to manage stress. And of course, it goes without saying, seeking uh, professional counseling and therapy if you are feeling overwhelmed. So um, thank you so much for having me um, this evening. I really do hope that this information has really um, spoken to you. And I realize that you may have questions and hopefully we'll have some time to um, answer those questions. Um, I should also add that these slides and will be turned into a video which I will then post on my website and I will put that up with um, Simon um, who will share that, um, of course, through his social media channels. So I will just hand back to um, Simon. Thank you, Tony. Um, again, really informative and some really simple things that you can do to, to help manage your stress. I can really relate to the forgetfulness and I really love the the lifestyle recommendations um, and, you know, the really simple things that you can do for sleep. Sleep's probably one of the simplest things you can do to, to help manage your stress and developing a routine, a, a sleep routine. Um, so just, just a little bit of a, about what I offer, and I offer personal training and virtual and face-to-face -face training. Hopefully we're back in the gym pretty, pretty quickly um, or soon. 
Um, and I've also got offering group personal training, um, both, both virtually and face-to-face. So they're 45 minute sessions um, and they're, um, well, they involve strength and fitness um, and also a bit of mobility. Um, and uh, they're on most, well, six days a week. Um, and we're offering boxing. We've got a, a new studio with uh, a boxing ring. So we're offering boxing uh, skills and fitness, which involves some shadow boxing, some pad work, heavy bags, all that sort of stuff. And we're offering nutrition and lifestyle coaching. Um, so what we talk about is metabolic typing. It's, you know, your unique ratios of fats, carbohydrates and protein. So there's no, Tony talked about, there's no one diet for one person. And this is, we identify what's right for you. And we also give you lifestyle strategies, well, to manage your stress and to help your health and well-being or enhance your life. I can guarantee if, if you follow some of the things that I implement, then it will really enhance your life. Um, so I'm offering a special offer to, aren't you lucky that you're getting a special offer? So to, for the people, well, for um, the new people here today, um, I'm offering two weeks free group personal uh, training. So, and that's either virtually or face-to-face. So you can choose whether you want to do it face-to-face when we're back in the in the studio or, and I'm also offering my existing clients two weeks free boxing trial. And you can also bring a friend if you like. So like I say, I hope we're back in the gym very soon. Um, And you can reach me well at Jack and Hill studio on Facebook or Instagram, or you can also uh, reach me on uh, hello at jackandhill.com.au. So but uh, again, thank you, Tony, and I'll uh, we'll hand it over some for some questions if you'd like to ask Tony. I got one there, Tony. If you want a sec. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, thanks for the um, thanks for the, the informative session tonight. I just um, took on board everything you were trying to say there while cooking. But one thing that um, I sort of struggle with there is trying to switch off at night. I know you said about the devices and things, but just keeping regular thoughts, like we're in sales and in sales, you know, you get on a real high, real low, and always just thinking about what I need to do to progress that deal or the sale going along. Um, And always thinking, what's the consumer thinking? You know, why aren't they signing or what, like, how do you, how do you suggest just stop thinking at six o'clock and then just spend the time with the family as such? So what's important there, um, is it Sahil? It is, yeah. Yeah, so Sahil, um, you may indeed be getting some of your most important thoughts at that time. So what I would suggest is dumping them down on on paper or a smartphone um, (laughs) instead of keeping them in your mind because what you're doing is processing them and so you're giving more um, energy to those thoughts. Uh, But but if if you allocate a time, such as uh, it might be the next day when you have a walk for an hour during lunchtime, that that's when you use that period um, for processing thoughts. So you've got to find your time. And let me just give you an example. Um, I do a lot of editing. So when I write an article um, or or a book, for example, um, my conducive time to writing is the morning my most conducive time to editing is the evening or sorry, the afternoon after 4 p.m. So yeah. I, I never cross the two together, but it might be, Sahil, that if I'm out uh, walking or, or exercising, I'll have some interesting thoughts. Yeah. So I'll dump them on my, on my smartphone uh, and I use an Android device so that when I come home, I can link it with Windows 10 and then I can dump all that information and then yep. use that. So what I'm suggesting is that you create something similar yes. um, and maybe use your device and then throw it on there, dictate um, whatever device you have, whether it's an iPhone or an Android, um, use the dictation component and just get your thoughts out of your mind and onto paper or a device. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Are there any other questions?
I don't think so. No, Anybody think else? Hi, Tony, Sharon, how are you? Sharon, how are you going? I'm really well, thanks. Um, it was great to listen. And interestingly, sometimes you get so stuck in doing the doing that the word mindfulness that you used a couple of times during the session was that I, I probably realised by, you know, listening, watching this and stopping for a minute that, you know, some of my behaviours I either reaching for the chocolate um, several times a day is probably a really um, high level stress indicator that I just ignore a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Sharon. And and we're all prone to those types of things and they become automated responses, hence the, the mindfulness component. Um, and all we really need to do, we don't even need, it's suggested that we don't even need to stop reaching for the chocolate, Sharon, as much as being mindful that we have an urge to have the chocolate. And if we keep doing that over time, uh, we notice our, our pattern and our behavior yep. that automatically we begin distancing ourselves from the chocolate and we might gravitate towards what we really need. Mm. Um, mm. And, and it might be just self-compassion that we really feel overwhelmed. And chocolate is a way of reinforcing that we need self-love. And, and by self-love, I mean... Uh, comfort, that's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, sense yeah, of comfort. Yeah, yeah. So it's just, it's, it's really um, mindfulness and observing what we're feeling and thinking. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, my pleasure, Sharon. Thank you for the question. Come on, don't be shy, everybody. <laughs> answer any more questions you can type your question if you like as well if you don't Simon want I noticed you owned up to your forgetfulness yeah <laughs> <laughs> yep I'm good at that yeah keys and wallet are mine uh, wallet. yep or even now it's glasses now too as well oh, right. and phone and phone well, well I too many things to remember. I mentioned my client uh, Jerome, and and yeah, he would he would. I can't begin to tell you how many iPads and iPhones he's lost in the back of Ubers and taxis in Sydney. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Mm. All right. Well, well, thank you everybody for coming along. Really appreciate you coming along, and um, yeah, or we. Well, and thank you, Tony, um, for um, your awesome presentation. And, uh, you know, um, yes, yeah, so I hope that you've got some, some really good takeaways tonight. So as John Kennedy said, go and do, do it now. Absolutely. And just yep. on that, Simon, um, yeah, again, we'll put those notes. Uh, I'll put yep. all this together in the form of a video post it up on my website and YouTube. So if you want to share this um, webinar tonight with, with loved ones or work colleagues, then uh, I'll get Simon to post that up on his social media channels. And then of course, Simon can then um, um, broadcast that to you. And hopefully you can share that with those who need to receive this message. All right. Thank you. Good. Thanks, Simon. No Thank problem. you. Thank you, everyone.